All right, so I should warn you. Um, well, you already know, like, because of only friends today, like, I, you know, did all that work to go to the dump. I, I really wasn't feeling well. I couldn't say this on OnlyFans, but it was poop. Like, dog poops from the house, dog poops from the the cleaner that puts them outside. Like, he picks them up outside and throws them outside. Um, yeah. So, that, it was, like, and really hot. And some of it was from weeks ago. Like, because it had been building up. So, and I had a headache from while well, shaking. There are things that were stressing me out, you know, like yesterday. So I took a couple of Tylenol and it didn't hit me like immediately. The nausea from that, like my stomach was like digesting it and, you know, it didn't hit me immediately, but it was a problem. And so it started to get the smell, my vomit reflex, then the heat, it's 115 degrees baking in the car. And I made it actually to the Dunkin' Donuts and they were doing like construction inside. And I just left. I was like, there was no one at the counter at first and I'm looking at the donuts and I'm like, none of it looks good to me. Like it, in the coffee drinks, it all looked like it was good. I was going to make me sick. Like the sugar would be like, like burning in my stomach. And I couldn't think of anywhere I could eat in that area, but I ha wouldn't have to like go in to order and sit there. So what I did was I realized like, what do I want? I want like soup, rice, and I'm like Chinese special. So I ate some of the rice, um, a little tofu, but I gave the rest to Rex and he really liked it. Fila didn't want it, um, but he was happy. He, he ate like it had carrots and snow peas and he ate those. Um, but okay, so this happens. And I had a lot of anxiety. I was shaking a lot. I was really feeling sick. So I take my Xanax, what's, you know, I don't have many left, but hopefully I'll get a different prescription for something when I have my uh, a new psych uh, psychiatrist on the uh, third. So I take that, which can make you sleepy. But instead of taking a nap, I wait in the pool. <laughs> so I'm warning you, like, I probably won't be up too late because um, I'll, I'm probably going to start to get sleepy and sleepy from that. And then the long day, no nap, the heat. And then if I take a shower after, wash my makeup off. So I may be going to bed early, which isn't a bad thing, but I'm letting you know, like, uh, during tonight's read, I might start progressively get more tired. But I got stuff done today. That's good. And, and, I wanted to take it a, a clip, really a photo, but it's it'd be easier to do a video uh, of what I I did at the dump of me sitting in that chair. When I saw that chair, I was like, you know what, Sal? You know what you should do? You should um, sit in there in there and then pose so that you can memorialize this next time you see some crap at the thrift that you don't need and be like, well, look at the, aren't you proud? It went uh, from the thrift, even though it was a dollar to the house. And then in the house, I bumped into it, hurt my feet on it. And then I ended up posing at the dump. Actually, I wanted, I wanted to take a picture and title it like, do you like my, uh, my new, uh, home makeover, <laughs> but, uh, I was not doing well at that point already. So anyway, a long day already. Um, but in a nice swim, how was yours? And are you excited? For what comes next in our book, you mi you male chauvin chauvinist pigs. I did not know that these these pantyhose are a symbol of male oppression. Nobody ever told me that. How dare how dare you continue to oppress me? But don't I look really good in my oppression? I have to admit, oppression looks good on me. <laughs> it's a really pretty oppression, I think. <laughs> okay. It looks so hot. Thank you. I love these guys. 
high up those high waisted uh, Victoria's Secret in the nineties. Vintage thing. Okay. Now, chapter five. This book is so funny. I can't wait till we get to the part about the more of the pantyhose. <laughs> and do you notice every time I read the word pantyhose, I have to like project my voice to say pantyhose. Because <laughs> I love that saying it. Now, Prozac was still in a snit the next morning, wriggling out of reach when I tried to give her her morning back massage. The minute she finished inhaling her breakfast, she leapt up on top of my bookcase as far away from me as possible. Yes, she was in major prima donna mode, but I didn't care. All I could think about was my lunch date with Andrew. I'd forgotten all about yesterday's disastrous events and was floating around the apartment on a cloud of unrealistic expectations. By the time I nuked my morning coffee, I was mentally ordering flowers for our wedding. <laughs> Nothing could bring me down off my Andrew high, not even those ominous emails from my parents. I smell the trouble ahead. When it comes to daddy, there's always trouble ahead. Daddy attracts trouble like white cashmere attracts wine stains. Not that I believe he was actually jinxed. The only person jinxed in that relationship was mom. True, mom could never remember Prozac's name <laughs> and was constantly bombarding me with unwanted gifts. But she's a darling woman and now daddy would drive her crazy for weeks, if not months to come over his lucky Hawaiian shirt. But for once, I wasn't bothered by the sense of impeding disaster, nor was I troubled by the prospect of a sequin short set and dogs playing poker showing up at my doorstep. I bet you, uh, I bet you John has that, that picture on his wall, right? <laughs> this is a classic. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, that was my motto du jour. After checking my emails, I took a deliciously long bath up to my neck in strawberry scented bubbles. By the time I got out, Andrew and I had just bought our first house in the suburbs. Then I blow dried my curly mop until it was smooth as silk and floated into the bedroom to get dressed for my date. I tried on several outfits before going with jeans, an Ann Taylor blazer, and a fabulous pair of high heeled suede boots I bought on sale at Bloomies. I surveyed myself in the mirror and saw to my delight that yesterday's monstrous zip was barely noticeable. Girl, why are you gonna wear pantyhose? After a dab of makeup and a spritz of hairspray, I was ready to go. Out in the living room, Prozac was still perched on top of my bookcase. Bye, darling, I called out to her as I headed for the door. You still mad at me? She glared at me through slitted eyes and began crawling the, clawing the paint off my bookcase. I took that as a yes. I was heading down path to my car when I saw my neighbor Lance stretched out in a lounge chair outside his apartment. Lance and I share a quaint 1940s duplex on the fringes of Beverly Hills where the rents are manageable and the plumbing is impossible. Lance works flexible hours as a shoe salesman at Neiman Marcus which gives him plenty of time to loll about on lounge chairs in the middle of the day. That morning, he was wearing cut off jeans and nothing on top, not an ounce of flab visible on his perfect bod. Hey, Jake, she's objectifying him. These, hold on, the, those jeans are a symbol of 
female op oppression. <laughs> See, I'm doing a reversal. See? Hey, Jade. He looked up. He looked me up and down and nodded approvingly. Nice outfit. I beamed. That was high praise indeed from a guy who says moths come to my closet to commit suicide. Thanks, I creamed. Then his eyes narrowed suspiciously. Those jeans don't have an elastic waist, do they? Lance hates elastic waist pants. He thinks they're classless and tacky and very Jerry Springer. I keep telling him that they're comfortable and he keeps telling me that I've got to suffer for beauty. Yeah, right. The only thing I'm willing to suffer for is a hot fudge sundae. No, I assured him, they're not elastic waist. To prove it, I opened my blazer and showed him the uncomfortable set in waistband. Whatever you do, he warned, don't unbutton the waistband. We don't want to look like a lady teamster, do we? I won't unbutton the waistband. You promise? I swear on a stack of J. Crew catalogs. He smiled, satisfied. Okay, guys, but don't you think you'd be impressed if you were on a date with a lady and she took you to a buffet and she started off the evening by unbuttoning her pants to make room for all the the food she was going to consume. <laughs> this is my Thanksgiving pants, okay? <laughs> That's the kind of lady that will that will score you extra chicken wings when she's up. You know, if you're taking turns at the table, I used to do that with my with my mom. I was thinking about my mom today. A, a, a song in the car came on that really brought back a memory of her. She, I was in Florida and she she heard that song and she wanted to Shazam it on her phone. And oh, just like, that, that, I think that was probably a little bit of why it was so like anxiety. But anyway, let's go to, let's go to her date. Uh, so where are you off to? Oh, just a lunch date, I said, playing it nonchalant. Date? He sat up, interested. Did I hear the word date coming from your lips? I nodded. It's about time. I was beginning to think you were a nun. It's not that bad, I protested. Honey, the last time you were out, they were dancing the minuet. Pretty hard. So, who is the lucky guy? A bank executive. I met him on a job interview last year. Cute, adorable. Well, if it doesn't work out, give him my number. Will do. He beamed an encouraging smile. You look terrific, Jane, really. With Lance's approval ringing in my ears, I headed down the path to Wheezy where I unbuttoned the waistband of my jeans <laughs> and set off for my date with Andrew. I debated about whether or not to take the freeway. I doubted Wheezy could dredge up the energy to go more than 40 miles an hour. Okay, but here, okay, but here's the thing. Here's the thing for the men out there. Now, if you go on a date, so say say it's you and like you're you're meeting her. Look at I got my um elastic oh, <laughs> elastic waist on. Alright. Okay. So don't you think though that you might be like oh, how do I say this? Okay. Would you, would you be like analyzing the girl for if she, if she would be 
like a pig because then you're gonna be like oh like oh what if she oh don't you guys would say like oh you have to look at what someone's mother looks like because that's what they're gonna look like and i just think that would be funny if you like hire like a fake mom or like if they had, if they were if you were like adopted and you know <laughs> or what if they have like two dads anyway so um i was just thinking that if wouldn't it be better if they showed like all their horrible habits so you know what you're getting because otherwise don't you think that they're like lying like if like don't you think it'd be more polite if she like if she was like a berber and she like starts like she likes to scream obscenities like hey where's the goddamn waiter hey like wouldn't you want to know like that they're not hiding and being all demure and then once they get married there's they like let out a burp and they're like they loosen the waist pants and they're like listen bob i don't want to try anymore but then again i feel like the men like would you ever do that on a date like the women wouldn't they think you're rude but then of course after you're like married like wouldn't you take like your pants down <laughs> or do you like i do, do you, i guess like do you like well i, I was gonna say never leave the toilet seat up but i guess like historically that's what they say women complain about but do you have to like i don't know like <laughs> it's like potpourri <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm trying to learn through these romance novels or these girl girl books about how to do the dating. I don't know. I debated about whether or not to take the freeway. I doubted Wheezy could dredge up the energy to go more than 40 miles an hour. But cross town street traffic would be a nightmare. So I decided to risk it. And so I spent the next 20 harrowing minutes clutching the wheel with white knuckles as Wheezy coughed and sputtered her way in the slow lane. Pedestrians were making better time than I was. <laughs> I'm happy to report that Wheezy didn't conk out on the freeway. Yeah, LA traffic is no joke. No, she conked out 60 seconds after we got off the freeway. I was stopped at a traffic light when I looked down and saw all the warning lights blinking merely on the dashboard. I tried gunning the engine, nothing. Poor Wheezy had breathed her last breath. I checked my watch. It was five of noon and I was at least 15 blocks away from the patio, the restaurant where I was supposed to meet Andrew. No way I was going to make it there in five minutes, not in my fashionably high-heeled boots. Suddenly, I heard a blast of car horns. I turned and saw a line of cars backed up behind me. I motioned them to go around me. I was sitting there, blocking traffic and cursing crazy Dave and his wreck mobiles. When I heard someone tapping on my car window, I looked up and saw a tall black man. His name was Leonard. At least that's what the name embroidered on his denim work shirt. Can I help you, lady? He asked when I rolled down the window. I looked up into his eyes. They were kind eyes, warm and sympathetic. And then out of the blue, before I could stop myself, I was crying with big hiccupy racking sobs. This is crazy, I told myself. What was I doing? Crying in front of a perfect stranger. I'm ruining my eye makeup too, but I couldn't stop myself. Lady, what's wrong? Oh, Leonard, I wailed. First, my car was stolen. And then my insurance company gave me 15 crummy dollars a day to rent a car and I got stuck with this lousy piece of junk. And I finally got a date with the man of my dreams and he asked me to meet him for lunch. And I crawled along the freeway with my knuckles practically welded to the steering wheel. And just when everything was looking okay, Wheezy died. 
Leonard shook his head sadly. I'm so sorry for your loss. My loss? The deceased, this Wheezy person. Oh, Wheezy's not a person, it's my car. I see, he said, nodding much like I imagine orderlies nod to out of control mental patients before they strap them into straitjackets. <laughs> I fully expected him to back away and be a hasty retreat, but instead he took out an impeccably clean hanky from his pocket and handed it to me. Blow your nose, he said gently. Everything's going to be fine. I'll get you to that lunch of yours. What an angel. I made up my mind then and there that if I ever had a child, I was going to name it Leonard, provided it was a boy, of course. But first, he said, let's get this car of yours out of traffic. He had me put the car in neutral and steer it while he pushed it to the curb. You can call a tow truck when you're ready to go home, he said, when we were through. Now, let's head over to my van and I'll give you a lift. Was he the nicest guy in the world or what? Hope began to seep back into my heart. Maybe this day wouldn't be a total washout after all. Then I saw his van engulfed. Leonard, it turned out, was an exterminator for a company called Bug Blasters. And the man he drove had a six-foot replica of a dead bug straight out of Kafka, lying belly up on top of it. Like, that sounds cool, actually. Is, it, is that like the car that, from a Dumb and Dumber? Oh, well, I told myself. So it wasn't a limo. Big deal. Beggars can't be choosers. Hop inside, he said, sliding the door open. And then suddenly I got scared. Leonard seemed like a wonderful guy. The very definition of a good Samaritan. But hey, so did Ted Bundy. And I hear Jack the Ripper was a lot of laughs at parties. What if Leonard was a secret sex fiend planning to have his way with me under the giant bug? I could practically hear my mother shouting, never get into a car with strangers but then i thought of andrew and the way his hair curled at the nape of his neck and threw caution to the wind i hopped on board it turned out that leonard was as nice as could be an absolute doll who gave me all sorts of handy tips about getting rid of ants boric acid along your baseboards works wonders in case you're interested we zipped over the patio in no time here we are, he said, pulling up in front of the restaurant, only 10 minutes late. Oh, Leonard, how can I ever thank you? Let me give you my card in case you ever need an exterminator. I took his card and promised to call him at the first signs of termites, cockroaches, earwigs, and or silverfish. Then I turned to open the van door and gulped in dismay. I'd never been to the patio before, and I now saw that the restaurant took its name from a spacious outdoor patio facing the street, a patio which was, at that moment, filled to capacity with upscale, well-groomed diners, all of whom were gawking at the van with the giant dead bug on top. Dear Lord, I prayed, please don't let Andrew be sitting outside, but there he was, out on the patio's patio, gawking at the van like everybody else. Oh crud, what would he think of me showing up for our date in a bug blaster's van? I consider telling Leonard to drive to the next block and that I'd walk back, but he been so nice to me I couldn't insult him by letting him see that I was ashamed of his profession. There was no getting out of it. I gritted my teeth and climbed down out of the van, treating the alfresco diners to a swell view of my tush. It was a toss up over which of us looked more ridiculous, me or the dead bug. Gathering what was left of my dignity, 
I made my way to Andrew's table, trying to ignore the stairs following my wake. Andrew stood up to greet me, looking yummy. In a pinstripe suit, his hair curling seductively over his collar, just as I remembered it. That was quite an entrance, he said, barely suppressing a smile. Did you know your butt looks really big climbing out of an exterminator's van? Okay, he didn't really say that part about my butt. I just prayed he wasn't thinking it. I plopped down in my chair and explained what happened to Wheezy. What rotten luck, he said, when I was through. But don't worry, we'll call a tow service after lunch and take care of everything. He smiled a reassuring smile. I just love men with reassuring smiles, don't you? Anyhow, he said, I hope you like this restaurant. Oh, I do. If not, there's a roach motel nearby. Okay, he didn't say that either. My imagination was in overdrive. What he actually said was, I'm sorry I dragged you all the way downtown, but I've been working night and day on a project with Sam Weinstock. You remember Sam, don't you? Inwardly, I groaned. I remember Sam. All right. Sam, short for Samantha Weinstock, was the CFO of Andrews Bank. A stunning woman with the face of a Clinique model and a waist the size of my ankle. When I met her last year, I was sure she and Andrew were a hot item. Just the thought of her made me feel 10 pounds heavier. Actually, Andrew said, she's here in the restaurant having lunch with a friend. Dread. The last thing I wanted was to be in comparison range with the spectacular size to Sam. In fact, she is right over there. I followed his gaze to where Sam was sitting across from another razor thin biz gal. If I'd been harboring any secret hopes that working long hours had taken its toll on Sam, I was in for a disappointment. She was as spectacular as ever. Her delicate face framed by a gleaming crown of chestnut hair, not a single one of which dared stray out of place. Andrew waved to her, and the next thing I knew, she was getting up and heading in our direction. I hoped against hope that she was going to the ladies' room but no such luck. She was going. She slithered straight to our table. Hello, Jane, she said coolly. Hi, I managed to mutter. I just prayed she hadn't seen me show up in the giant bug mobile. Once again, my prayers went unanswered. So good to see you again, she said, a malicious glint in her eyes. What a colorful entrance you made. Yes. My rolls is in the shop, ha <laughs> ha. Andrew smiled at my feeble attempt at humor. Sam didn't. How have you been, she asked. Still writing toilet bowl ads? As a matter of fact, I am, I said, wishing with all my heart I could flush her down a big john. Well, don't be too long, she said to Andrew, wagging her finger at him playfully. We've still got lots of work to do, hun. Accent on the hun. <laughs> Then she waved goodbye, an irritating little flicker of her hand, and slithered back to her biz gal friend. As I watched her walk across the room, resplendent in her size two suits, I felt every ounce of confidence drain from my body. I'd been a fool to think Andrew was interested in me. Anyone who dated a woman like Sam couldn't possibly be interested in me. This wasn't a date, I realized. It was a business lunch. Andrew probably wanted to offer me a job writing brochures for the bank. My initial instincts had been right. If he were really interested in me, he'd have asked me out to a candlelit dinner. So, Andrew said, you're still working for to Oil It Masters? What did I tell you? 
he was asking about work, it had to be a business lunch. Yes, I'm still in the toilet, ha ha. And how about you? You still at the bank? What am I saying? Of course, you're still at the bank. <laughs> Otherwise, why would you be working on a project with Sam? Unless you were working in some other profession and freelancing as a banker, I suppose that's possible. Not likely, of course, but possible. Oh, Lord, I was babbling again. Damn, that Sam. She totally thrown me for a loop. Before I could stop myself, I reached for a sourdough roll and smeared it with butter. Now Andrew was going to think I was a butter slathering blabbermouth. Oh, well, who cared? He wasn't interested in me anyway. Thank heavens the waiter showed up to take our order and put an end to my inane chatter. Andrew and I both ordered the patio burgers with fries. That's what I like about you, Andrew said when the waiter had thought. You eat like a real person. He watched as I shoveled down my butter roll. So many women I dated spend the entire meal pushing three shards of lettuce around their plate and then say they're stuffed. That's no fun. So he said, taking a roll from the basket, you seeing anybody? Whoa, I almost choked on my sourdough. Maybe this was a date after all. No, nobody on a regular basis. If you don't count the Domino's delivery guy. Me neither, he said, smearing his roll with butter. What about Sam? I thought you two were dating. We were, but that's over now. I glanced over at Sam's table. Her lunch companion was chattering away a mile a minute, but Sam was staring past her and watching us with eagle eyes. Maybe Andrew thought it was all over, but it sure didn't look like Sam got the message. Anyhow, he said, I've been wanting to ask you out, but he stared down at his roll and hesitated. But what? What's stopping you? Go ahead. Here I am, ready and available. But I'm not sure it would be fair to you. Why wouldn't it be fair? You see, I'm only going to be in LA for a short time, and then I've got to go back to Stuttgart. You're going back to Germany, I said, not bothering to hide my disappointment. I'm afraid so. And while I'm here, I'm barely going to have a minute to myself. This project Sam and I are working on is taking up practically all my time. I'll bet she is. I mean, I bet it is. He took a bite of his roll, a tiny dot of butter. <laughs> clung to his cheek only andrew could look sexy with the butter on his cheek having loaded you down with warnings he said i'm hoping you'll still want to have dinner with me he shot me a heart-melting grin. No, I told myself, absolutely not. Why start something that couldn't possibly go anywhere? I'd fall head over heels in love, and he'd go off to Stuttgart and meet some blonde Fräulein and forget all about me. Prozac was right. i just wind up getting hurt. Scrumptious as he was, there was no way I was going out with this guy. So I hardened my heart. I looked him straight in the eye and said, sure, <laughs> what can I say? Andrew was like a pint of chunky monkey in my freezer, impossible to resist. Our burgers came and I didn't bother to pretend I was a dainty eater. I dove into mine with gusto. Hadn't Andrew just said he liked a gal with a hearty appetite? I would have liked the opportunity to impress him with my dessert eating skills, but there was no time for desserts. The stats are instant our waiter 
whisked away our lunch dishes, Sam popped up at our table, reminding Andrew that they still had lots of work to do at the bank. Andrew quickly paid the bill and drove me to Wheezy, where we phoned for a tow truck and sat back to wait. There we were, just the two of us, as snug as two bugs in a BMW. I should have been in seventh heaven, but instead I was suddenly flooded with doubts. What was I doing with this guy anyway? We were worlds apart. He was upper crust and I was pizza crust. Sure, he was cuter than cute, but what if underneath that yummy exterior, he was Sam's counterpart, an elitist snob. How about a strawberry, he said, interrupting my thoughts. He reached for a box of strawberries in the back seat. Thanks, I said, plucking one from the box. They look delicious. I bought them from one of those guys on the freeway. In Los Angeles, there are always poor souls standing on freeway off ramps, selling flowers and fruits. I dread to think how little they're paid to stand in the blazing sun, breathing in carcinogens all day. Most drivers just zoom past them, but every once in a while, some kind soul will stop and buy their wares. No, what they do is they jump on your car, like, like, I got you, and like start squeegeeing your window. And it's like, pay me, you pay now. Like, get off my window. Get off my window, you know? But yeah, other than that, <laughs> at the fruit of questionable origin. <laughs> it hardened me to think that Andrew was one of those souls. Aren't you going to have one, I said, when you didn't take any? No, I'm allergic to strawberries. You mean you bought the strawberries even though you can't eat them? He nodded. The guy looked so sad, I couldn't say no. At that moment, any doubts I had about Andrew flew out the window. He was obviously the warm-hearted softy of my dreams. I wanted nothing more than to linger in the BMW with him, trading life stories and running my fingers through his curls. But that was not to be. Not three minutes after Andrew offered me that strawberry, the triple A guy came roaring up and with lightning speed had Wheezy hooked up and ready to tow. I'll call you soon, Andrew said, beaming me a megawatt smile, and we'll set up our dinner date. I came this close to hurling myself across the stick shift and into his lap for a torrid goodbye kiss. But You'll be happy to know I restrained myself. Instead, I hoisted myself into the cab of the tow truck, treating Andrew to another scenic view of my tush, and headed off to the vent my spleen on crazy <laughs> off to vent my spleen on crazy Dave. One of my cars is broke? Impossible. Crazy Dave, aka Vladimir polished off the piece of baklava he was eating and shook his bald head incredulous crazy dave's cars never break yeah right crazy dave's probably had a place of honor in the tow truck hall of fame maybe you just need change of oil he said how about i keep the oil and change the car no no he insisted nothing wrong with cars after wiping his sticky fingers on his jeans, he opened the engine hood and peered inside. Aha, he exclaimed with all the solemnity of Einstein discovering the theory of relativity. I see problem. The fan belt snapped. Happens all the time. To fix his easy sneezy. One, two, three. He went scurrying into his office and minutes later came out waving a dirty fan belt practically brand new he exclaimed and true to his word in no time at all he changed the fan belt i got in the car started the engine and wheezy sputtered back to life see 
crazy day of being. Nothing wrong with car. Good as new. Weezy belched a huge cloud of exhaust. Still pouring like kitten. Purring like kitten, he said, stroking her hood. Ray, I sighed, then started to pull out of the lot. I hadn't gone very far when I looked in my rearview mirror and saw Crazy Dave running after me, holding something in his hand. Wait, he cried. He caught up to the car, breathless. I have something for you. He held out a gooey hunk of baklava wrapped in wax paper, a present. He beamed, grinning, to make up for your troubles. I looked down at the baklava in his greasy hands. This was his idea of making amends. Well, if he thought he could buy me off with a measly piece of baklava, he was absolutely right. I scarfed it down at the first traffic light, so much for venting my spleen. I don't even know what baklava is. <laughs> it's like, is it like a, it's like a croissant, like a pastry? Chapter six. Well, let me have a sip of water. When are we going to get to the pantyhose death parts? Hopefully so. The last thing I wanted to do that night was see Dorcas comedy act. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. But she was my one and only client. So after a nutritious dinner of peanut butter and pretzels, I got in wheezy and headed over to the Laugh Palace. The club was on a busy street in the heart of West Hollywood, where parking spaces at night are as scarce as straight men. <laughs> I drove around searching for a spot for about 10 minutes. Finally, I gave up and handed Wheezy over to the Laugh Palace's valet parking guy, a skinny teenager in a red jacket and black bow tie. He looked at the ancient VW in disdain. You want me to park it or shoot it and put it out of its misery? Obviously a budding comic. I tried to think of a snappy comeback, but what could I tell him? That my real car was a Corolla? So I just tossed him the keys and headed Inside, if I could pick one word to describe the Laugh Palace, it wouldn't be palatial. A dark, cavernous room with a tiny stage up front. It had all the charm of a meat locker. At 8 o'clock, early in the evening, in the comedy world, the place was only half full. A bouncy barmaid in tight shorts and a t-shirt that said cute but psycho came up to me holding her round bar tray aloft. She wore her jet black hair in a ponytail at the top of her head, pebble style. Table for one, she asked. No, I told her. I'm with Dorcas McKenzie, one of the comics. Oh, her, she said dismissively. She's over at the bar she pointed a neon pink fingernail to a bar at the back of the room then she trotted off with her drinks her ponytail swishing as she walked i headed over to a warm eaten bar and inhaled the intoxicating aroma of beer and lysol dorcas sat at the end of the bar sipping a coke through a straw Hi, Dorcas, I said with fake enthusiasm as I sat down next to her. How's it going? Okay, I guess. She looked about as happy as a condemned prisoner waiting for her last meal to show up. Actually, she confessed. I'm a little nervous. I always get nervous before I go on. I'm sure it'd be great. I lied. Oh no, she says, I'd be nervous too if I had an act like hers. 
I'm sure it would be great, I lied. At the other end of the bar, the nasty comic I'd seen at the deli was deep in conversation with his writer. Isn't that the guy I saw the other day at Pinky's, I asked? Yeah, that's Slick Vic. All the comics hang out at the bar while we wait to go on. Indeed, I saw a few other guys standing around mumbling their monologues to themselves. Dorcas was the only woman in the bunch. It was open mic night at the club, a night when they let anyone get up and perform, apparently regardless of talent. Up on stage, a chubby guy oozing flop sweat was trying in vain to amuse the audience by making fart noises with his underarms. They always put the weak acts on first, Dorcas explained, and save the stronger comics for later, which means you should have been on hours ago, <laughs> Vic quipped. The comics at the bar snickered and Dorcas turned red. Shove it up your kazoo, Vic, she shot back. At which point the bartender, a beefy guy who looked like he came over to take my order, the beefy guy who looked like he could moonlight as an extra on The Sopranos came over to take my order. Hey, Pete, Dorcas said, this is Jane, my writer. Nice to meet you, he said with a wink. I got the not very pleasant feeling that Pete was taking a shine to me. So you're going to write for Dorcas, huh? Lots of luck, Vic called out. You're going to need it. Just ignore him, Dorcas, Pete said, loud enough for Vic to hear. He's a jerk. I could see Vic's jaw clench in anger, but Pete... was a refrigerator of a guy, and Vic was no dummy. He pretended not to hear. So what don't you have, sweetheart? Pete said to me, wiping a glass with a dishcloth that looked like it had just come from a car wash. I figured anything that didn't come in a glass was a safe choice. I'll have a bottle of water. That'll be six bucks. Six bucks for a crummy bottle of water? plus a three drink minimum. There went my first week's salary. But for you, he said with another wink, I'll make it a two drink minimum. Then I'll live it up and have two bottled waters. Pete flashed me a gap to the grin and hurried off to get my waters. At a nearby table, I saw a customer eating a burger and fries. The fries looked pretty darn good and i was tempted to order them but if the kitchen was as filthy as pete's dishcloth i didn't want to risk it is it safe to order the food here i asked dorcas not unless you've got a stomach pump in your purse rumor has it the chef seasons his burgers with sweat i guess i'll stick with water smart choice by now the fart comic had farted his last farts and a potbelly mc came bounding on stage. He wore an electric blue jumpsuit unzipped halfway to his navel, exposing a small forest of chest hair and enough gold chains to stock a QVC warehouse. Interesting fashion statement, I said. That's Spiro Papadalos, Dorcas said. He owns the club. For his sake, I hope he had better taste in comics he had in clothes. Spiro proceeded to introduce a hot new comic, making his debut appearance on the Laugh Palace stage, a gangly guy in jeans, t-shirt, and blazer, which seemed to be the standard stand-up outfit, came out on stage, terror shining in his eyes. Something told me this was his debut appearance on any stage. He had no confidence whatsoever. He mumbled his material and was sweating into the mic so badly, I was afraid he'd electrocute himself. Where'd Spiro dig up this guy, Vic said loudly. He makes Dorcas look like Dave Letterman. 
the other claw makes a laugh, and Vic looks particularly proud of himself, having managed to trash two comics at once. Just then, I noticed a fragile beauty with long Botticelli hair approaching the bar with a violin case. That's Allison, Dorcas whispered, following my gaze. Vic's girlfriend, she's a concert violinist. She must have just come from a rehearsal. She looks sweet, I said. She is. Way too sweet for a creep like Vic. Does she always bring her violin with her to the club, I asked. Dorcas nodded. Last year, her violin got stolen from her car, and now she won't let this one out of her sight, especially not around here. It's not exactly the safest neighborhood. That was encouraging news. <laughs> Make me someone would steal Weezy, and then Crazy Dave would be forced to give me another car. <laughs> Allison walked over to Vic and kissed him on the cheek. Hi, babe, Vic called out, not bothering to lower his voice. Vic's writer, Hank, smiled at Allison shyly, then quickly went back to making notes on index cards. So, babe, Vic boomed, how did the rehearsal go? Shh, honey, she said, glancing at the comic on stage. You're talking too loud. The audience won't be able to hear him. Trust me, Vic said. I'll be doing them a favor. The audience burst out laughing, much to Vic's chagrin. The gangly comic on stage had scored with a joke. I looked up and saw he was looking a lot more sure of himself. The tide had turned. The audience, previously indifferent, had decided they liked him, and with good reason. Now that he stopped mumbling, he was a funny guy. Dorcas poked me in the ribs. Watch Vic, she whispered. I bet he takes out his recorder. Sure enough, now that he realized the kid on stage was getting laughs, Vic took out his cigarette lighter and pressed the button. I shook my head in amazement. This guy made pawn scum look classy. The comic finished his act to loud applause and Spiro came bounding on stage, gold chains flashing, thrilled at last to have someone getting laughs in the Laugh Palace. Spiro wasn't so lucky with his next act. The incredible Roberto, a guy who told bad jokes while juggling steak knives. One false, fake false move, I thought, and he'd be the incredible Roberta Oh my God. <laughs> By now, I finished the first of my $6 waters and needed to take a tinkle. I excused myself and asked one of the barmaids for directions to the ladies' room. She pointed down a long, dark corridor. Last door on the right. I walked down the hall past a couple of doors till I got to the ladies' room, a disgusting cubicle that had last been disinfected when mastodons roamed the earth. I'll spare you the gory details. I'm only bringing up my trip to the ladies' room because of what happened when I was through. I was heading back down the hallway, wishing I'd brought along a spray can of Lysol, when I heard a woman's voice raised in anger. I've had enough of your excuses. It was coming from one of the rooms along the corridor. The door was partially open, and I peeked inside. What can I say? I'm nosy. It was a supply room, and standing there among the crates of swizzle sticks and Brand X booze was Pebbles, the cute but psycho barmaid, looking pissed. And the object of her hissy fit was none other than Vic. When are you going to tell Allison about us, Vic? Soon, baby, he said, stroking her cheek. Real soon. That's what you said six months ago, she said, swatting his hand away. Hey, it's not easy. Allison and I have been together for three years. I don't care how long you've been together. You promised me you'd leave her, and you better do it or you'll be sorry. At that moment, her ponytail quivering with rage, she seemed to live up to the cute but psycho warning plastered across her chest. Then, she turned on her heels and headed for the door, which was my cue to get the heck out of there. What took you so long? 
Dorcas was a bundle of nerves when I got back to the bar. I go on any minute. She picked up an oversized tote bag from the floor and set it on the bar. I peeked inside and saw that it was filled to the brim with pantyhose. <laughs> Here we go. I buy them by the gross. Oh, me too, honey. Me too. <laughs> she said, grabbing a pair and stuffing it into one of her pants pockets. So you don't actually take them on, on off on stage, I said, relieved that she wasn't going to be doing a strip act and perpetuate a per perverted male sexual fantasy? No way. Uh, here's a message from our sponsor. <laughs> I perpetuate that perverted male fantasy all the time on my OnlyFans. Link below. <laughs> <laughs> then she reached into the tote and pulled out a pair of scissors which she shoved into her other pocket finally she took out her cloisonne lipstick case and slapped on some chapstick and now Spiro was saying let's welcome to the La Palace stage a very funny lady Dorcas McKenzie Bombs away, Vic called out, sending off a fresh round of guffaws from the comics at the bar. Dorcas flushed in dismay. Don't listen to them, I said, squeezing her arm. You'll be great. She put on a brave smile and hurried up to the stage. I admired her courage. It takes a lot of guts to be a comic, especially when you don't have any actual jokes. <laughs> Dorcas got up to the mic and started to do the same material I'd heard in the deli. It hadn't gotten any funnier since then. The same feminist diatribe about women being forced to conform to unrealistic ideals of beauty, all very untrue, or all very true, all very boring. <laughs> the audience wasn't paying attention. People were ordering drinks and talking among themselves, biding their time until the next act came on. And I'm ashamed to confess my mind did want a little wandering of its own. I thought back to the scene I just witnessed in the darkened corridor. So Vic was cheating on his girlfriend with Pebbles the barmaid. I wasn't surprised. Hiding Dorcas told me Vic flirted with anybody in a skirt. I looked across the bar at Allison, one of the few people in the audience not talking over Dorcas's act. I could see the pity in her eyes as she watched Dorcas dying up on stage. Allison was clearly a kind soul. What was she doing with a guy like Vic? He was probably one of those rats who, in spite of their rathood, managed to charm their way into the hearts and panties of good women. Maybe he's got a micro. Have you, have you ever thought of that? Sad to say, there's a lot of that going around. Look, I feel like maybe you would tolerate a lot of crap if they got a nice micro going on. For a fleeting instant, I wanted to run over and tell her what a creep he was, how he was cheating on her with pebbles, but of course I didn't. Instead, I was jolted out of my reverie by angry booing coming from the audience. Somehow, in just minutes, the audience had turned from bored to hostile, Dorcas was ranting her feminist spiel to a room of mainly drunk jocks, and the natives were getting restless. They wanted someone on stage who would tell the backroom humor they were so fond of. Finally, her act came to a merciful close. She cut up her pantyhose with scissors and threw the bits out into the audience. The only laugh she got all night came next when Vic shouted, Forget the pantyhose, dork, and throw out your act. The audience roared. Poor Dork just came back to the bar, her face burning with humiliation. Hey, Dork, Vic sneered. Want a little constructive criticism? You stink. His toadies at the bar snickered. Screw you, Vic, Dork just said. Then she took a big gulp of her coke and muttered, I'd like to kill that bastard. I'd like to help, I said, and I meant every syllable. Now, if I just...
bond the way Dorcas bond. I wouldn't dream of hanging around the scene of my humiliation. I'd hightail it out of there and back home to my bathtub as fast as your head would spin. But not Dorcas. She plucked herself down at the bar and ordered a double scotch from Pete the bartender. Anything for you, sweetheart, Pete asked me. No, I said, holding up my $6 water bottle. I'm fine. I guess if it's right, Dorcas said with a sigh. I stink. That's not true, I lied. You have some very funny material. Like you said, it just needs tweaking. She looked up from where she was tearing a cocktail napkin to shreds. You really think so? No, I wanted to scream. Of course I don't think so. You're about as funny as an open wound. You're never going to make it. So quit now and save yourself the heartache. But she was looking at me with such hope in her eyes. I couldn't bear to bust her bubble. Sure, I managed to say. Hey, I've got an idea, she said, brightening. Let's stay here and work on my act. Here? Don't you think it's a little too noisy? Nah, she said with a wave of her swizzle stick. It'll be fine. I had absolutely no idea what to do with her act other than burn it. But it didn't matter because Dorcas didn't really want to work that night. What Dorcas was really, really wanted was to get drunk, which she did with impressive speed. By the time she finished her second scotch, all her confidence had come bouncing back. And at, and she was convinced that The people in the audience were a bunch of low-life bores who wouldn't appreciate true comedy if it sat on their lap. I spent the next 45 minutes listening to Dorcas trash the audience and nursing my $6 water. I'd be damned if I'd spend one more cent in this place. Although by now, the smell of those fries was driving me crazy. Meanwhile, a series of foul mouth comics took their turn on stage, doing acts that would make a longshoreman blush. The jocks in the audience ate it up. I like comedy as much as the next person, provided the next person isn't the Marquis de Sade, but I just didn't get it. What the heck was so funny about the F word? The only time I ever found the F word remotely laughable was when I was doing it with the blob. No, my idea of a funny four letter word was Lucy, but nobody was asking me my idea and the locker room language was getting solid laughs. By now, the place had filled up. Most all the tables were taken when Vic was finally called up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Spiro was saying, let's give a warm Laugh Palace welcome to a rising young comic star, Vic Cleveland. More than anything, I wanted Vic to bomb, but in the life isn't fair department, he was very funny. He had strong jokes and terrific timing. And amazingly enough, once on stage, he actually seemed likable. Gone was the smarmy comic shooting zingers. Under the spotlight, Vic was an affable guy with a disarming grin. Even when he started taking some cheap shots at his ex-wife. He was still funny. 
The audience loved him. I was sitting there musing on the injustice of it all when I felt someone poke me in the ribs. I turned to see a rumpled man in his 60s on the bar stool next to mine. His sports jacket had clearly seen better days, and his few remaining hairs were plastered across his head in a hideous comb over. That's my client, he said, his barrel chest puffing with pride. I was guessing he'd once been a muscular guy, but those muscles had long gone ago turned to flab. I'm Vic's agent, Manny Vernon. He fished out a business card from his pocket and handed it to me of the Manny Vernon agency. The card was a dog was dog-eared at the edges and blotched with coffee stains. Lord knows how long it had been sitting in his pocket. I found Vic when he was waiting tables at IHOP. And now look at him. Now he's waiting tables at some fancy restaurant on Melrose. And soon he won't even need to do that anymore. His round face shone with pleasure. Any day now, my Vic is going to be a star. Just then, the comics at the bar started whispering excitedly as Spiro ushered a chiseled blonde in an Armani suit to a ringside table. Look, I heard one of them say, it's Regan Dixon. I had no idea who Regan Dixon was, but whoever she was, I bet my bottom Pop-Tart she was important. Vic finished his act to enthusiastic applause. He's not so damn funny, Dorcas groused. Into her scotch. If it weren't for Hank's jokes, he'd be nothing. I looked over at Hank, who, like Dorcas, didn't seem to be taking much pleasure in Vic's triumph. I wondered if he resented Vic basking in the limelight while he sat back here in anonymity. Up on stage, Vic bowed with false humility. Then, after milking the applause for as long as possible, he held up his hand for silence. Hey, everybody, I've got some good news I want to share. I've just signed a network pilot deal a deal I never would have gotten without my agents. Regan, or without my new agent, Regan Dixon. In fact, she's headed to New York tonight to finalize the deal. Come on, Regan, stand up and take a bow. The Armani beauty got up and waved to the audience, her white blonde hair shining like a halo in the club's hazy air. Meanwhile, next to me, Manny Vernon's face was a most unsettling shade of gray. Are you okay, I asked? But he just sat there, staring straight ahead in a state of shock. Vic made his way back to the bar, smug with victory smiling and nodding as his fellow comics showered him with insincere congratulations at which point manny sprang to life and grabbed Vic by the elbow oh boy oh boy <laughs> you little ingrate he shouted obviously having regained his powers of speech after all i've done for you you're walking out on me afraid so Vic said shrugging free from his grasp but you can't leave me manny wailed we've got a contract that's what you think it expired last week manny blinked confused it did that's why you don't have any clients vic smeared too many senior moments pal time to pack it in and think about assisted living <laughs> oh my god manny crumpled back down 
on his bar stool as if he'd just been punched in the gut. How could you, Vic? Allison had pushed her way through the circle of comics and was looking up at Vic in disbelief. How could you fire Manny after everything he's done for you? Allie, baby, if I stuck with him, I'd be waiting tables all my life. It's a tough world. You gotta break some eggs to make an omelet. Break eggs? This guy would break legs to get ahead. I'm long overdue for some changes in my life, Allie. In fact, I've got something I need to tell you. At the edge of the crowd, Pebble's eyes lit up in anticipation. It's about time, I heard her say. Oh my god, was Vic really going to dump Allison for this bimbet? Nope, as it turned out, he was going to dump Allison for someone else. Someone several notches higher on the food chain. As we were about to witness when Reagan, the mega agent, joined the happy little crowd at the bar and linked her arm through Vic's. You killed him, honey, she said, planting a kiss on his lips. Guess what, everybody, Vic announced. Regan and I are engaged. Now it was Allison's turn to be speechless. Sorry about that, babe, Vic said to Allison with a shrug. I'm driving Regan to the airport to catch the red eye. I'll come back to the house afterward and get my things. A beat of shocked silence descended over the bar. A silence that was broken by the crash of broken glass. Pebbles the barmaid had dropped her tray of drinks. She stood there, open mouth, the words cute but psycho, practically pulsating with fury across her chest. Then Allison burst into tears. At the sight of those tears, Hank jumped off the bar stool and raced over to Vic. You piece of slime, how could you do this to her? The veins were throbbing in his scrawny neck. What are you complaining about, Vic said. I'm doing of you a favor, buddy. You always had the hawks for Allison. Now's your chance. Hank blushed furiously and took a wild swing at Vic. Clearly, Hank had never been on his high school boxing team. He missed by a mile. Vic grabbed Hank's arm and pinned it behind his back. You don't really want to do this, do you, buddy? Hank thought it over and, flushed with shame, shook his head no. Vic smirked and let him go. Get yourself another writer, Hank said, rubbing his arm where Vic had twisted it. I quit. Boo-hoo, Vic said. I'm shaking in my shoes. Writers are a dime a dozen. You're going to need one, Hank countered, if you keep using cliches like that. Come on, sugar buns, Vic said, rushing past Hank and putting his arm around his trophy agent. Let's get out of here. Sugar buns! Vic, had Vic just called this power woman power broker of a woman sugar buns surely she'd object but no she just smiled up at him lovingly Vic had obviously worked his magic on her just as he had on Allison and Pebbles the happy couple headed for the exit when suddenly Dorcas who'd been silent up to now erupted like a long dormant volcano with a guttural roar, she shoved her bar stool aside and charged across the room. Before anyone could stop her, she jumped on Vic, tackling him from behind. He tried to fight her off, but unlike Hank, Dorcas wasn't that easy to get rid of. Propelled by rage, she was surprisingly strong. Within seconds, she'd wrestled Vic to the ground and was sitting on his chest, her hands around his neck. You worthless excuse for a human being, she bellowed. You've hurt enough people on this planet. You don't deserve to live one minute longer. 
Then she began strangling him. Vic lay trapped beneath her, grasping for air. But Dorcas was oblivious, her hands locked in a vice-like grip around his neck. Oh my God, Regan cried out. Somebody stop her. Yeah, Spiro said, racing over to the fracas. I'm not insured for this kind of thing. Funny how nobody else was all that eager to save him. Finally, Pete the bartender said, oh well, I suppose somebody's got to do it, and leapt over the bar. But he needn't have bothered. At that moment, Dorcas released her grip on Vic's neck. He stared down at her hands, puzzled, as if waking from a bad dream. Whatever rage had taken hold of her had drained away. The volcano was dormant again. Vic, however, was not nearly so calm. He glared at her with undisguised loathing. You're going to regret this, he hissed. And indeed, she would. No way I was going to let Dorcas drive home. The woman had chug-a-lugged enough scotch to open her own distillery. Come on, I said, as I led her outside. Let's walk over to Pinky's and get some coffee. Wait, she stumbled over the door jam. I forgot my idea book. Her idea book was a loose leaf binder filled with half-baked notions for her act. She'd taken it out for our work session only to ignore it with the arrival of her first scotch. I'll go get it, I said. I popped her up against the door and hurried back inside. A desperate comic was struggling on stage for the audience's attention, but nobody was listening. Most of them were still buzzing about the dramatic scene they just witnessed. At the bar, Manny was staring morosely into a glass of cream soda. Allison, her face blotchy with tears, was sitting with Hank, who held her hand, patting it sympathetically. Although the expression on his face was one of concern, I couldn't help but notice a look of longing in his eyes. I thought about what Vic had said, that he was doing Hank a favor by breaking up with Allison, and wondered if Hank was secretly happy at this recent turn of events. I headed over to where Dorcas had been sitting, her idea book was on the bar where she'd left it. Pebbles, the barmaid, was behind the bar taking a surreptitious slug of beer. As I reached for the notebook, I heard her say to Pete, too bad she didn't go through with it. Yeah, Pete laughed. For once, Dorcas gave people something they wanted to see. I returned to the entrance and picked up Dorcas where I'd left her. She propped up against the door still propped up against the door. Somehow I managed to steer her over to Pinky's where I spent the next hour pouring coffee and bacon and eggs into her, waiting for her to sober up. On the plus side, I finally had an order of those fries I've been lusting after all evening. I don't know what got into me, Dorcas kept moaning. Three double scotches and a strawberry margarita, that's what. Vic got me so mad, she said spearing a piece of bacon something inside me just snapped i understand frankly i didn't blame her for what she did not the strangling part of course but the knocking vic to the ground and putting the fear of god in him he needed a dose of that you should have seen the look on his face she said sopping up the last of her eggs with a piece of toast for once the little rat looked scared then she grinned true confession it felt great I bet it did. She sat up straight. All that coffee and animal fat seemed to have revived her. If I was a fool to let Vic get to me, someday he'll be punished for all the rotten things he's ever done. I believe that what goes around comes around, don't you, Jane? I couldn't have disagreed with her more. Plenty of people went unpunished for their sins. People like Lucrezia Borgia, Ivan the Terrible, and the guy who invented spandex bike shorts, to name just a few. But I just smiled and nodded. Meanwhile, she said, I'm going to show Vic how funny I can be. I'm going to show everybody. By now, her eyes were shining with determination. I'm going to be a star, Jane, and you're going to help me. Talk about your mission impossible. I signaled to the waitress, check, please. I walked Dorcas back to her car, then forked over Five bucks. 
I couldn't afford to retrieve Wheezy from the wise guy teenage ballet. You going to be driving a home, he smirked, or pedaling? By the time I staggered home to my apartment, I knew there was no way on earth I could work for Dorcas. I simply couldn't make her funny, not without a brain transplant. I'd have to turn down the job. So what if I didn't have the money for a new car? If I had to ride around town on a bicycle, so be it. All I needed was an excuse, some way to let Dorcas down gently. <laughs> Maybe I tell her I was entering a convent or going on an unexpected honeymoon or joining the Peace Corps and moving to the Fiji Islands. Okay, so they weren't exactly believable, but it was after midnight and I was exhausted, but I needed I needn't have bothered thinking of excuses. As I was about to learn the next morning, I wasn't going to have to write jokes for Dorcas after all. Not unless she planned on doing her act from jail. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. That's not the end of that chapter. We've got more emails. Okay. You've got mail to Jousten from Daddy O. Subject, good luck gone forever. Dearest Lamb Chop, now that mom has given away my lucky shirt, my life is a shambles. Here's a list of what's gone wrong in the past 24 hours. My computer crashed. I lost 18 holes of miniature golf to Ed Peters. I sat on my prescription sunglasses. And you know how I've always had great luck finding parking spaces? Not anymore. I can't find a parking space to save my soul. Yesterday, I had to park five blocks away from the post office when I went to mail you that painting of dogs playing poker. What can I say, Lamb Chop? Thanks to your mom, my good luck is gone forever. Your desolate daddy. To Jousten from Shop Till You Drop, subject, it's all in his mind. Jane, darling, daddy has been driving me crazy. He's convinced that he's living under a black cloud of bad luck. Of course, it's all in his mind. I sneaked a peek at the email he wrote you, and it's all nonsense. First off, his computer didn't really crash. When the repairman came out to fix it, he discovered that Daddy had accidentally knocked one of the cables loose. That's all. Nothing was broken. The big computer crash was just Daddy being the usual, his usual clumsy self. And all that moaning and groaning about losing at miniature golf to Ed Peters, Ed always beats him at miniature golf. That's what started the whole Sunday brunch food fight that got Daddy kicked out of the clubhouse. Now, Daddy's convinced himself that he never lost to Ed when he was wearing his lucky shirts. And I don't care what he says, Daddy's never had any luck finding parking spaces. Why, he'll circle around till he practically wears out his tires before he finally breaks down and pulls into a parking lot. As for his prescription sunglasses, Daddy's always sitting on them. In fact, the last time he sat on them, he was wearing his lucky shirts. But worst of all, is something Daddy didn't write about. He's convinced he's lost his ability to perform in the boudoir. Oh my God, do you need to say that to your daughter? <laughs> you know, I don't like to talk about these kinds of things with you, darling. But you can guess what that means. No dipsy doodle. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh dear. If only I hadn't given away that silly shirt of his. Your frazzled mom. P.S. I sent away for a male potency vitamin. Oh my god. <laughs> vitamin from the shopping channel called Vitamans. They're fed xing it overnight. Maybe that'll help. Okay, so that is the end of chapter six. I was like, oh my God, what is the next one gonna be? It took, it took mom to pound towns. All right, what did you think of that? Mm. Dorcas is in jail. Dorcas is in jail. My vision, my flavor. So I uh, 
got a chance was was it yesterday was it last night to look at some of hunter biden's arts because i heard that it was like he was like you know how they always happens with like politicians they'll do like speeches usually like they all do it but they said like he had sold his art for like um large sums and like if it was like some like special favor or something so i was like let me see some of his art and i was ready to hate all of it but it's really it's not the worst like some of it i like he has this like on like metallic you know maybe it's like what pale said about a lot of artists being you know like on some something when they're <laughs> getting inspired oh the stuff with the snakes i don't like i don't like i don't like snakes but some of it i was like i don't totally hate. no i don't know what they were going for and i don't know like what like a you know a monet would be worth or what you know like, i gotta assume like great art a lot of it's is kept like for the public like like Stonehenge, you know, like it, like an artifact. They don't let him like chisel a dick into Stonehenge in England. <laughs> like you protect it for people, to, you know. So I think um, I was like, but you know, it's not that I like like the guy. No, I still like. I would rather rip my eyeballs out of my head, eat them, or no, crush them so they're like they cannot be in use anymore. Then eat them then mm, poop them out then look at his dick <laughs> okay i still find him completely disgusting okay uh not to be rude but uh i do think that um some of the some of the art's not bad you know i i do appreciate art <laughs> it's you know the effort like even if you know it's like someone might buy it for like a lot of money you still put in some effort like if you have some audacity if he just puts like <laughs> You know, like a smiley face, like, come on. His style is a blatant ripoff of various native. Oh, is it really? <laughs> I didn't know that. I just assume, like, he maybe had some kind of training. Like, I don't know if he did it himself, but, like, he must be able to use expensive um, tools and, you know, have plenty of time. I mean, he probably has more luxury to do that than the average struggling artist. Um, but I, I don't know, like if there was like a little talent there, so I thought his art is better than George Bush's like George Bush. Um, at least the last I saw of his, like, he does like, does he do like portraits or like a dog? And it's like, that's, you know, that's cute dad. Like that's cute pops. But it was like, yeah, you know, like a clearly like just for like a, <laughs> the hobby, <laughs> a fake silk and dialogue vibe. Yeah. But anyway, um, that's all the news I got around to was looking at his art because I um, was at the dump today <laughs> and the getting Chinese food and in the pool. And that was all my exciting day. So, yeah, I'll see. I'll see how long it takes me to get completely sleepy. But I, I did make it through the book. I it was I thought that this book is very fun. I'm, I might want to get more of her other novels because I find her really funny. <laughs> <laughs> but first we're going to find out what happened with the pantyhose. Um, and so today is Wednesday. I have to bring the trash out tonight and I'll be back reading tomorrow. So I see you then. And I see you in OnlyFans and I love you.